In this video, I will provide an in-depth analysis and criticism of Skinner's book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. In the book, Skinner presents arguments for structuring society on the basis of his behaviorism. In other words, he will be arguing that the behavior of individuals in society ought to be controlled in the same manner as how dogs may be trained to respond to the ringing of a bell. This is an important and highly influential work, the foundation of which was established by William James's American Pragmatism. The behaviorist influence exists in a very powerful way in today's society and comes into play in all of the media and advertisements. Skinner begins his book by emphasizing the very serious problems that exist in the world today. In calling them terrifying on page one, he hopes that the reader will feel frightened and be emotionally prepared to accept the radical so-called solution to the problems which he proposes. We have to be aware of the fallacy to appeal to emotion here. Skinner argues that technology is to blame for the troubles of society, but this is problematic insofar as technology itself is not a decision-making entity capable of assuming blame for poor decisions regarding its use. Skinner says on page one that as we look for solutions to the problems, we naturally turn to the things we do best, meaning technology. Skinner is talking as an American, and more specifically as a Harvard professor who has contributed to the shaping of U.S. society, and so not only the United States. He is arguing that since our strength is science and technology, on page one, we ought to adopt as solutions to the problems which cannot be solved by other science solutions provided by behavioral science. As the title of the book suggests, Skinner is going to propose an alternative to the social framework provided by J.S. Mill. Skinner claims that his proposal is rooted in science and advocates a scientific approach to social organization. By contrast, Mill's approach is a liberal arts one in both aspects. For the worry reader, several questions ought to arise at this point. What is behavioral science? Is it really a science? And what is meant by science in the context of behavior? And most importantly, does behavioral science have any useful knowledge to offer? How far can it take us in solving social problems? Would we find the solutions, if any, that it provides to be desirable? Skinner is right in saying on page two that the application of the physical and biological sciences alone will not solve our problems. He is also right in saying that the cultivation of the liberal arts and common sense have not led to the disappearance or avoidance of serious social problems. However, it does not follow that the development and use of behavior or any other new science would overcome the problems. Skinner is putting all of his emphasis on technique at this point in the book and ignoring the role of values in determining what a person counts as a problem and as a solution to it. And he is also ignoring the role of politics in determining what is and is not done to create or solve problems. Consider the example of atomic weapons. Physics alone did not create the problem of atomic weapons. Crucial was the decisions of those with the power to develop and use them for their purposes. Even if a behavioral science could tell us how to make people behave in such a way that atomic weapons cease to be a problem, as far as some people were concerned anyway, then that would still not mean that the knowledge actually be used to achieve that result. Those with power might decide otherwise. Knowledge on its own accomplishes nothing. How knowledge is used is another matter of choice. Choice on the part of those with power, and that choice will reflect their values and objectives. The reason why, as Skinner admits on page 3, that people are frightened by the prospect of highly developed behavioral science is that they know that the people in power may use it to make things worse rather than better. Skinner also admits on page 3 that a behavioral technology comparable in power and precision to physical and biological technology is lacking. Behaviorism, now in decline, has little to show for the huge effort which has been put in. It represents an attempt at a shortcut to controlling people. It presupposes that we can find correlations between environmental circumstances and behavior, such that behavior can be controlled by varying the environmental circumstances. The inner workings of the human being are left out of the account. From the capitalist point of view, the inner states of humans are irrelevant. If behavior appropriate to maximizing the profits can be induced without taking the inner states into account, but from most points of view, it is important to define what is socially desirable, at least partly in terms of the inner states, e.g. pleasure, knowledge, and etc., so that even if a highly developed behavioral science were possible, it would fail to address and lead us to neglect those matters of vital human concern.
When Skinner complains that scientific understanding of man lags behind scientific understanding of other parts of his world, it should be remembered that it is precisely behaviorism which has diverted effort from such promising lines of inquiry such as physiological psychology. It is even more ludicrous to say that we will still look to Plato and Aristotle to understand human behavior whilst having progressed beyond the ancients in physics. We read Plato and Aristotle as philosophers, not as scientists studying human behavior, which they are not. In addition, Skinner continues, on pages 3 and 4, to muddle the issues of how much we know, and how well we can control social conditions, and how satisfied we are with the social conditions at the status quo. Perhaps people who are in control know a great deal, and control stat uh, social conditions well, using Mill's framework if not to the satisfaction of those who are greatly afflicted by problems. All of the problems which Skinner lists on page 4 are in fact soluble on the basis of present knowledge. Their existence is a consequence of the choices made by those who are in power, like Skinner. To try to gain acceptance of behaviorism, Skinner argues, through pages 5 to 13, that if progress in the natural sciences depended on depersonifying things, then progress in the science of man will come from depersonifying persons. Well, it is one thing to deny the existence of things which have only been thought to exist on account of confusion, and another to deny existence of, or ignore, actual inner states and processes of people, whether these be uh, psychological or physical. Thus, it is one thing to deny that there are non-material entity called the will, but it is quite another thing to deny the existence of or ignore the actual inner states and processes involved in deciding to act, suffering pain, and etc. Would we want to try to understand even the behavior of a car without taking into account its inner states and processes? Different people will behave differently under identical circumstances because their inner states and processes are different. For example, one may have more willpower than another in dieting. How can we find even laws of human behavior if we ignore key determinants of behavior? Why favor the external environments of behavior over the internal one? The external one normally acts through the internal one, i.e. as a result of being perceived. Skinner complains on page 11 that the function of the inner man is to provide an explanation which will not be explained in turn. Of course there is no particular reason why causes of inner states and processes cannot be found, but some people, including Skinner, think that we can ascribe autonomy to people, which implies that they have free will, only if actions are uncaused. Accordingly, Skinner thinks on page 12 that the discovery of causes of behavior of any kind will undermine the idea that we are autonomous and have free will, and so he will seek to remove the attraction of the idea of the inner man. However, causation of behavior, unlike compulsion, is compatible with autonomy and free will, and one motivation for acknowledging inner states and processes is to achieve a proper causal explanation of human behavior, as well as other aspects of people. Skinner continually confuses causation and compulsion. He talks, on page 17, of controlling relations between behavior and environment. The word control is particularly confusing. As long as the person is implementing his or her own aspirations in a way devised by himself or herself, it makes sense to say that the person is acting autonomously, even if causes of the person's behavior can be found. The same fundamental point should be kept in mind when Skinner mentions the predictability of behavior, on page 18. The word control conceals the distinction between causation and compulsion. By applying an analysis of the language being used, the free will question in philosophy is easily dissolved. As long as a person has not been compelled or coerced to act in a certain way, then it is linguistically appropriate to describe them as having acted freely. Skinner raises on page 19 the question of who is to construct controlling environment and to what end? He never gives a clear and direct answer to this. As things stand, behaviorists are subordinate to the capitalists, and Skinner certainly does not advocate steps to overthrow capitalism. What he does say, on pages 19 and 20, is that the conflict between behaviorists and their opponents is one that can be resolved by the application of behaviorist control techniques. No intellectual reply to opponents will be given. They will be silenced by being brought into line somehow. This is such a fantastic response on Skinner's part, of course, because this is the very kind of behavior 
which fans hatred and fear of behaviorists. It is quite misleading of Skinner to say that the book discusses issues from a scientific point of view, even if he encloses the phrase in inverted commas himself. Science is mentioned, but the point of view is far from scientific, and Skinner is advocating policies which could not be justified by science alone. Skinner tacitly admits that his book is not scientific when he attempts to excuse his use of mentalistic vocabulary by saying that it suffices for purposes of casual discourse on page 21. Chapter 2. Freedom. The first two paragraphs distinguish reflexes, or conditioned reflexes, and behavior resulting from operant conditioning. These ideas, particularly the last, play a large role in Skinner's material. The category which, of course, is missing here is behavior resulting from rational thought about how to realize ultimate aspirations. Skinner says, on page 24, that some freedoms have attained through reflex behavior which has developed evolutionarily because of its survival value. As reflex behavior, the behavior does not result from my love of freedom. Of course, a desire for survival and for other things may incline us to not resist the operation of the reflexes and to induce certain conditioned reflexes. An important question, away from which Skinner tries to steer us, is the question, how free will we be to arrange what we want to do if we do not think about social arrangements, or if we allow people like Skinner to manipulate our behavior through conditioning. In the third paragraph of chapter 2, Skinner tries to further de-emphasize reflective behavior. Talking of avoidance of negative reinforcers, Skinner says, A great deal of physical technology is the result of this kind of struggle for freedom. Over the centuries, in erratic ways, many have constructed a world in which they are still relatively free of many kinds of threatening or harmful stimuli. Writing thus, Skinner distracts us from the role of planning, thinking, and such organizing principles as capitalism. In the fourth paragraph, Skinner asserts, on page 26, that in one form or another, intentional aversive control is the pattern of most social coordination in ethics, religion, government, economics, education, psychotherapy, and family life. Skinner overemphasizes the role of negative reinforcement, punishment, in existing control systems because he wants to gain acceptance of his own plan for total control of people by promising that his plan involves only positive, no negative reinforcement. Skinner is being totally unrealistic. Unless social coordination rests entirely on voluntary consensus, or communism, control has to rest on a mixture of reward, punishment, propaganda, and the availability of physical force. The relative importance of these factors, of course, varies from system to system. A system which tried to control by reward alone would have no effective way of dealing with their dissidents, who could ignore the rewards and go their own way, seizing power, possibly. A system which tried to control by punishment alone would provoke its own overthrow, because the system would be seen as intolerably harsh. Propaganda is needed to enable people to know that what behavior will be rewarded or punished. Physical force must be available to restrain those who would seize power to pursue their own ends. Skinner depicts even intentional control of people in terms of reinforcement. Take, for example, the blackmailer threatening exposure unless the victim pays by paying the victim escapes from the threat and reinforces the practice. Does this mean that the victim cannot help by paying and the blackmailer cannot help but repeating his crime? In reality, we know that, of course, both parties will think very carefully about what to do. The blackmailer may well understand that he has a very unique opportunity and that he would only lose everything from trying again. The particularly sinister thing about Skinner's distortions here is that he is systematically instilling an image of the human being as essentially passive and unreflective, devoid of any striving to realize ultimate aspirations. If the reader accepts this image, he or she is well down the road to accepting indoctrination, or even meaningless activity, instead of education, accepting life goals from other people instead of working them out for himself or herself, in general doing things which are externally rewarding rather than things which can be seen to contribute to deep satisfaction. In other words, by seeing themselves as passive respondents to external stimuli, people will automatically become putty in the hands of those who are in control. Consider, for example, people who spend hours watching television. The programs are designed to give little superficial pleasure to most people, 
but they are also designed to plant ideas about models of human relations, commerce, politics, and etc., which will lead most people to conclude that they can do nothing better with their evenings than to watch television, which seems like a rather familiar sentiment. Next, Skinner turns his attention to the literature of freedom, i.e. literature that attacks controllers or control systems which impose less than ideal conditions on people. He concedes, on page 29, the value of such literature in the elimination of many aversive practices of government, religion, education, family life, and etc. However, Skinner also chooses to attack the literature in a peculiar way. He wrongly claims, on page 29, that the emphasis has just been on how that condition feels, rather than on freedom itself. Just as obviously, the kind of literature that Skinner is talking about normally advocates the replacement of one social order by another, containing a different set of freedoms, perhaps permitting a greater degree of self-realization to some or for all people. Skinner goes on to say, on page 30, that the feeling of freedom becomes an unreliable guide to action as soon as the would-be controllers turn to non-aversive measures. He is conjuring up the spectra of disguise control, the disguise consisting in the use of rewards instead of punishments. Paternalistic control is certainly harder to resist, other things being equal, and then is more uh, punitive control, because by definition there is already more to lose and less to gain. But for reasons already indicated, that does not mean that one could hope to control by reward alone. Skinner's examples are deceptive, because we can easily overlook some of their aspects. A wage on its own will not induce a person to do work he or she does not like. There must also be an absence of preferable alternatives. People will not study uninteresting material just for some reward. Again, there must be an absence of preferable alternatives. Absence of other work, and the difficulty of reorganizing society to do quite different things, help make a man work in a dangerous uranium mine for higher wages. Compulsory attendance and fear of unemployment may help to make a pupil study boring material for high grades. The most significant aspect of Skinner's treatment of examples on page 30 is his presupposition that people will be acting under external control achieved either through reward or through punishment. What about study for the sake of knowledge? or for the sake of attaining some end that one sees the study as a means to. Marks may be indicators of progress in study, rather than determinants of performance in study. Wages may be a device for sharing out the fruits of work activity, chosen for its ultimate value, rather than that for the sake of which the work is done. Skinner is right in saying that people can be kept trapped in basically bad situations by manipulative measures which involve an element of reward. But again, it is necessary to stress that reward is just one of several control devices, and it is absurd to think that people will endure bad social conditions merely because they are offered rewards for so doing. Skinner is trying to make the readers forget their intelligence and their dynamicism precisely because they can otherwise be expected to come into play and strive for the best possible social conditions. According to Skinner, on page 33, it is difficult to deal effectively with deferred aversive consequences because they do not occur at a time when escape or attack is feasible, when, for example, the controller can be identified or is within reach. It certainly helps if one can think, if one can piece the jigsaw of piecework or gambling together, as Skinner is actually doing. When Skinner says on page 33 that the immediate reinforcement is positive and goes unchallenged, he is presupposing unthinking people, people who cannot resist a quick reward designed to trap them. And when he says, on page 33, that the problem to be solved by those who are concerned with freedom is to create an immediate aversive consequence, there again will be no role for intelligent analysis. Contrary to what Skinner says, on page 34, it is precisely the literature of freedom that offers analysis of sophisticated control measures and offers advice on dealing with them. Skinner tries to blur the distinction between compulsion and control with the aid of reward, but of course there is a difference. A government which raises money through the compulsory taxation compels payment by creating a generally effective obstacles to non-payment. A government which raises money through voluntary purchases of lottery tickets does not compel payment because virtually nobody wishes to avoid buying a ticket is afraid to refrain from purchasing. The dangerous experiment and contraception examples are significantly different, however. 
The prisoner may not be free to refuse participation in the dangerous experiment if he or she finds prison conditions intolerable, and a person might be forced to participate in a government-sponsored contraception program if the money it provided them was necessary to survival. The key question is always, is there an effective obstacle to engaging in different behavior? The main paragraph on page 37 contains all kinds of muddles. Control is confused with causation, determined being the term that conceals the distinction. Having free will is confused with being socially free. These confusions may help to make it seem possible to have a system of control based on reward alone. After all, if punishment and force are eliminated, behavior will still be caused by something. But it may not be controlled by anything. It is reasonable of Skinner to say that a system of slavery so well designed that it does not breed revolt is a real threat. There have been many control systems which have been free of revolt for long periods, but every such system has tended to crumble eventually. The literature of freedom deals in a theoretically adequate way with control systems against which no one revolts successfully for a long time, but it takes more than a correct theory to bring about practical action. Certainly Skinner does not have superior insight into the problem of control. His own proposal of control, though, through reward alone, is not in itself a serious threat, although the totality of his propaganda is harmful in the ways that are being indicated. In quoting Rousseau, Skinner is quoting someone who really did have valuable insight into control, insight drawn upon by more cynical liberals, for example. As the quotation shows, Rousseau understood that people are very effectively controlled if one can induce them to the very things which are keeping them under control. Mill applied this idea in a spectacular way when he wrote On Liberty to persuade people to accept liberalism itself and the liberal model for democracy in particular. The most spectacular applications of Rousseau's idea occur when people are induced to commit themselves to very abstract principles like liberalism, which precisely because they're so abstract are easy to deceive people into accepting and comprehensive in their implications for life. Skinner is a crude amateur by comparison with Mill. Next, Skinner says that control is essential in a worthwhile society, that control without punishment is possible, and that in attacking control in general, the literature of freedom has diverted us from control based exclusively on reward to control based on weak measures and even punishment. Now, although control usually takes the form of compulsion, there is a distinction. Suppose one man voluntarily relies on another for guidance, and puts himself in his hands. The second man is then controlling the first, possibly taking advantage of him, but he is not compelling him. Thus, Skinner is quite accurate in saying, on page 38, that control is clearly the opposite of freedom. But what is essential in society is coordination, which need not take the forms of control or compulsion. As liberals realize, blind obedience is not in general valuable from anyone's point of view. Compulsion is needed in an individualistic social hierarchy, but the need for it would diminish the more that society enable people to realize their aspirations. People do not need to be forced to do what they want to do anyway. A normal person who is not conditioned to be passive will not simply put himself or herself in the hands of a controller who dispenses advice and or rewards. And for that reason, control by reward alone would not work. In addition, of course, the society would be insufficiently creative. In Skinner's proposed system, all real creativity would reside in the power group. Chapter 3. Dignity. Any evidence that a person's behavior may be attributed to external circumstances seems to threaten his dignity or worth, says Skinner. Of course, if it were not the person that was acting, but the environment, then a person would have no behavior to take credit for. But people do behave, and we admire some behavior, and some people for their behavior. It is true that our admiration rests upon a certain assumptions about the behavior, such as we usually admire a person who is copying someone else less than a person whose performance is original. But what exactly are the conditions which have, have to be met before we find an act or an agent admirable? Does Skinner succeed in showing that it follows from a scientific analysis of behavior? that the necessary conditions are never met? He does not, for then again he confuses causation and compulsion. He is right in saying that we are not inclined to give a person credit for achievements which are in fact due to forces over which he has no control, 
but it is wrong to think that if all of our behavior is ultimately caused by external factors, then we are not in control of any of our behavior. That would be only so far as if all of our behavior were compelled. According to Skinner, we refuse to give a person credit when the causes of the behavior in question are obvious. This does suggest that Skinner is right, but is his premise true? If I knew the exact causes of a tightrope walker's successful performance, would I admire it any less? If I knew the exact causes of a hero's heroic act, and it remained true that the hero acted in the face of great danger for the sake of mankind, would I admire the hero any less? We simply do find certain behavior, and people, admirable. Knowledge of causes is relevant to knowing what kind of behavior we are dealing with in a given case. For example, knowing that a speech is caused by a prompter, rather than inspiration, puts a speech in a category that may make it less admirable. However, we do not insist that no cause at all be identifiable. We need to know which causes were at work, not whether the causes were operative. Granted, we do not always admire reflex behavior, but this is not because we believe it has causes. Rather, it is because of the specific nature of the cause. Reflex behavior does not reflect the person's character or ability in the way that a heroic act or a creative act does. Commanded behavior may be admirable if the ability is needed to execute the command, or it may be despicable if the person commanded is too cowardly to resist the order. Similarly, rewarded behavior may be admirable if it reveals a prowess or is not engaged in for the sake of the reward, but our attitude changes if we find that a person is performing it in a mediocre way or just for the sake of the reward. Thus, while certain types of cause must be absent if a behavior is to be admired, we do not demand a total absence of causes. For example, even after discovering the causes of a person's learning to use a piece of equipment for himself or herself, we would still admire the performance if it reflected intelligence, perseverance, or some other quality which we do admire. Skinner is misconstruing when he says on page 47 that when we are concerned with the credit to be given to others, we minimize the conspicuousness of the cause of their behavior. If we prefer gentle admonition to punishment, then this may have nothing to do with an attempt to preserve the possibility of giving, and it may also have nothing to do with an attempt to preserve the possibility of giving credit. But if it does, that we are not trying to conceal causes, but rather we are trying to allow the person in question to show good character. In any case, gentle admonition is notably inconspicuous, and is sometimes more conspicuous than a punishment would be. So too for Skinner's other examples. It is not true that we are likely to admire behavior more as we understand it less, as Skinner says on page 49. In fact, someone might do something very condemnable that is also very hard to understand, and that would not make us admire it. Sometimes greater understanding decreases admiration, and sometimes it increases it, depending on what we find out. But Skinner is right in suggesting that a connection with autonomy, because prowess and good character are best displayed in autonomous behavior. When a person is behaving autonomously, it will also make sense to say that he or she is acting of his or her own free will, and to hold that person responsible for his or her own behavior thus forth. Autonomy is a matter of acting on one's own initiative, and it does not require an absence of causes. Skinner notices on page 50 that we express admiration of people and behavior, even when this will clearly have no effect on their performance. He is also conscious of the manipulative roles of praise and blame. We express admiration of a rock's beauty, obviously not with a view of causing it to persist. We want to treasure other people and be treasured by them, but this is possible only if the social system leaves us free to develop into or remain treasurable people, and if we do not allow propaganda to hide any real merits which people have. Skinner is undermining treasurability on both fronts. His cult of control is designed to induce passive acceptance of social influences which indeed would render a person untreasurable. His writing on dignity and worth is designed to convince the reader that treasuring another person is always irrational. The less respect we have for ourselves and others, the more compliant we will be in the hands of those who would control us. Chapter 4. Punishment. Skinner begins this chapter by discussing the ways in which people's freedom and dignity can be undermined. He writes as if he valued freedom and dignity. He is not afraid to attack an opponent for undermining freedom or dignity, even though he overtly proposes to do so himself. He uses value commitments which can be turned against him. 
This is true of his objection to punishment on page 56, according to Skinner, except when physically restrained, a person is least free or dignified when he is under threat of punishment, and unfortunately most people often are. Is it true that punishment is more destructive of freedom than some other measures? Skinner is certainly underestimating the power of ideas, or lack of ideas. One is not free to put one's coat if one does not know where it is. One is not free to shape life constructively if one has wrong ideas about how to do so. Both Skinner and Mill have written books which are designed to have an immense impact on a broad range of freedoms, and Mill certainly succeeded in his aim. Skinner attacks punishment in those whose social philosophies provide or for or necessitate the existence of punishment. He is currying favor with the reader by pretending, quite unrealistically, that there could be a control system based on reward alone. Punishment is necessary, though not necessarily in great quantity, as long as there are people who will not voluntarily adhere to the rules of society. It is the hope of the communists that at some point collectivistic society would have found ways for each person to be so satisfied that no one would see any reason to behave in a way requiring punishment. But if one is talking of controlling people, as Skinner is, punishment is necessary, and not merely in the sense of deprivation of a reward that could have otherwise been forthcoming. Skinner says, on page 62, that it should be possible to design a world in which behavior likely to be punished seldom or never occurs. Indeed, the fact that punishment and the threat of it are so common in society would make people wonder how democratic society really is, whether they really are free to do what they want the most to do. But the solution to the problem of punishment is not an unrealistic one of substituting control by reward for control by punishment. The solution is to abandon control in favor of organization by consensus. Organization is necessary for society, but how much control is needed, and what does the need for control imply? Skinner considers the objection of this proposal that it leads to automatic goodness rather than goodness by choice and that the loss of autonomy is bad. But what causes the loss of autonomy? According to Skinner, we never had it. But at the issue is really whether people will be organized through conditioning at their peril, of course, but why remain passive? Skinner is deploying propaganda to make people passive, but propaganda and reward together even are not sufficient to make everyone submit passively to manipulation by reward. The lack of creativity in such a society would soon lead to problems which would induce revolt, even if Skinner's social order had been established in the first place. Skinner obviously has a lot to learn from Mill. Skinner is right in suggesting that often what appears to be freedom is not. Thus a person who is afraid of divine punishment if he does something that he wants to do is no freer than someone who is afraid of legal punishment. Indeed, the ultimate source of fear may well be the same, e.g. powerful people who may not choose religion or law as a means of control. However, it does not follow that people must be subject to control. Instead of devising social rules rationally in the general interest of adhering to them, largely voluntarily, Max Skinner discusses holding people responsible for their actions. People are responsible for their actions when they are not compelled or subject to compulsive urges. Since Skinner confuses causation and compulsion, he cannot acknowledge that people can ever be properly held responsible for their behavior. He always thinks that it's just a result of their environmental conditions. Thus, he concludes on page 70 that the real issue is the effectiveness of techniques of control. And he says, We shall not solve the problems of alcoholism and juvenile delinquency by increasing a sense of responsibility. He says that it is the environment which gives rise to the problems, and that must be changed. Indeed, but how? By changing forms of control or by organizing the things in the general interest? Chapter 5, Alternatives to Punishment. In this chapter, Skinner considers what he regards as ineffective alternative measures to punishment. The first of these he designates as permissiveness, but he means anarchy. The problem with anarchy is not that central control is necessary, but rather that central organization is necessary if people are to live satisfactorily. Therein lies the objection of the communists to anarchy. Skinner's objection, on page 79, is that the abandonment of policy and leaves control not to the person himself, but to other parts of the social and non-social environments. It is the abandonment of policy at what was the center of organization. 
Skinner is certainly against that. His controllers will not be passive or subject to conditioning. They will have the initiative in the social order he favors. Skinner discusses helping people to think for themselves. He says that often more control is being exerted than appears on the surface, and he regards the procedures in question as valuable only to the extent that control is being exercised. This is what one would expect of someone who claims that control is inescapable, and that scientifically based control is better than other forms of control. But there is an important discussion between education and pseudo-education. In pseudo-education, the person may not think for himself or herself because of the influence of rewards and punishments or because of laziness. In education, the person thinks hard and rationally to reach truths which are important to him or her, irrespective of any other influences. This is what Skinner wants to avoid, to blind the reader to. The issue is whether one's autonomy comes into play, or is suppressed by the prospect of reward or punishment, or the presentation of limited alternatives among which to choose. Skinner also discusses people learning from and reacting to things in their environment other than people like books and etc. The discussion is strange because Skinner again insists on talking of being controlled by these things, and he complains that exposure of people to things does little to control their behavior effectively. But of course, the history of mankind that reveals that, through exercising autonomy and collaborating, people have learned a great deal about the world and have increasingly exercised their control over it. Under the heading Changing Minds, Skinner first remarks sarcastically that those who object most violently to the manipulation of behavior nevertheless make the most vigorous effort to manipulate minds on page 86. He goes on to talk about changing minds as if every piece of persuasion were a piece of manipulation. However, it is simply incorrect to say that one has been manipulated if one has been given additional information that leads to one to change one's mind in a way that is beneficial and involves no deception. Skinner complains on page 87 that when minds are changed, the control is inconspicuous and not very effective. This is nonsense. Mill, and to a far smaller extent Skinner, are inconspicuous in their efforts to change minds, and are very effective in many cases. If control is involved, and this is due to the factors beyond verbal performances themselves. Again, the issue is whether the person whose mind tries to change is functioning autonomously, so as to be capable of dealing with the persuasion rationally. Skinner tries on page 91 to blur the distinction between brainwashing and education by saying that people object to brainwashing simply because the control is obvious, but education is a matter of the absence of control over the learner, a matter of academic freedom. Skinner can claim that control is omnipresent only by counting on all causation as control. In a genuinely educational setting, there is not even a weak control. The path is taken by the student and is not even anticipated by the teacher and certainly not deliberately arranged. To sum up, Skinner represents a tendency to erode the liberal mode and the liberal practices and in institutions to give priority to control and at the expense of creativity. The results of this reaction to the social turbulence of the 60s are visible and felt in all aspects of life, from education to the economy and from personal relationships to the treatment of psychological problems. Skinner concludes this book in presenting an interesting argument for cultural design in saying that we cannot count on biological evolution to guarantee our future. As he says, extinct species and extinct cultures testify to the possibility of a miscarriage. But, of course, we have to raise the question of whether Skinner's proposals and activities actually contribute positively or negatively to human survival and well-being.